You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Heart Matters, where leading cardiology experts explore the latest trends, technologies, and clinical developments in cardiology practice. Your host for Heart Matters is Dr. Jack Lewin, Chief Executive Officer of the American College of Cardiology. Health system reform in the United States. It's an issue we've been talking about for years, but an area with vast room for improvement. What changes are taking place in our healthcare system today? And what are the fundamental elements necessary for future reforms? Our guest today is Dr. Uva Reinhardt, the James Madison Professor of Political Economy and a Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Dr. Reinhardt is recognized as one of our nation's leading authorities on healthcare economics. Welcome, Dr. Reinhardt. Hi, Dr. Lewin. How are you? I'm well, thanks. This is quite a, a tumultuous time in this country. Changes are obviously coming. What do you say the biggest challenges facing our health care system and its stakeholders would be? Well, the system itself and the new president is challenged, in my view, by the following economics. We, for people under 65, rely on the employment-based system to pay for health insurance. And the premium has to come out of what we call, we economists call the gross wage base, which you think of as the total debits a business makes to payroll expense. In other words, it's the gross gross number out of which come employer contributions, employee contributions, taxes, social security taxes of both parties. It's what we call the price of labor. Now, that has been growing at only 3% in the last decade, and it's likely to grow even more slowly in the next decade ahead. Yet, the Milliman Medical Index, which adds together what employers contribute to the premium, what employees pay to the, contribute to the premium, and their out-of-pocket expenses. You add these three components, they say it now costs for an average family of four in America $15,600 for health care. So that's the second factoid. The third one you need to know is that close to half, actually... 50% of the American families have an income of $45,000 or less, 50%. The income distribution is highly skewed such that the top 20% of income earners get 60% of all the income. So you put these three things together. Now take two earners, one works at Home Depot, the other one is a sales clerk. Let their wage base be 50000 now. Let it grow at 3% for a decade. That'll be 68000 a decade from now. But the health insurance, which has been growing at 8 9%, will grow from 15000 to about $36,000 in 2018. And what that means is that 53% of the wage base would be chewed up just by health insurance. What is left, the other 45% would have to pay Social Security taxes, income taxes, pensions, all of that. And you know that won't compute. The net effect will be that unless we do something, the number of uninsured is going to really grow in the coming decade, more than before. It'll probably reach 55, 60 million people who are really uninsured, not even underinsured. That's the challenge to the American people. Well, that's, uh, that is a big challenge. We're, we're going to have to get to the good news pretty soon. But, you know, you've, you've spoken about the dissonance between the delivery system and the payment system. So what do you think the new president and the new Congress will need to do in terms of this whole financing difficulty to shape up the system and maybe to even ensure that both, you know, evidence-based and cost-effective care, maybe even cost-effective administration comes into the mix? Oh, yes. I mean, yeah, there are these two components. The one is we do have to deliver good quality care to the American people more cheaply. Now, the reason why we know this can be done is twofold. One you alluded to, we are spending roughly 25% of total health spending. It's just administration. We were just at Johns Hopkins University and Dr. Bill Brody, the president, said Johns Hopkins Health System deals with 700 distinct managed care contracts, insurance contracts, each with different rules, different prices, et cetera. I serve on the board of the Duke Health System. I believe we have something in the order of 900 billing clerks for our system. 
That just has to change. There is no way you can justify this kind of expenditure to the average hardworking American taxpayer or premium payer. So the challenge here is on the private insurance industry to streamline the administrative costs. It should not cost that much to bill for Duke, and it shouldn't cost them so much to market health insurance policies. Medicare also. The Medicare rules are so arcane that every hospital has to have a compliance officer with three or four people with a hotline. I'm up in Canada at the moment. They don't have this. They don't fear to go to jail every day because of some Medicare rule they broke. So Medicare, too, has to look in the mirror and say, can we somehow decriminalize the administration of Medicare and make this simpler for people like other countries do? So that would save probably together, you're talking at least, suppose you cut it in half, they will save you 10, 12 percent of health spending, which is something like $150 billion dollars. Now, you've made that point so many times that this is one of the principal differences between us and the other developed nations in terms of you know, our health care spending, and yet it seems never to be on the agenda. No, that's the thing. I mean, evidence-based medicine, we've got conferences at any day in Washington all over the map, but no one ever challenges the AHIP, for example, on evidence-based administration. Do you actually need all these different rules in these policies? Can't you have a standard policy with a standard billing form? What do you see as working in the current system in terms of moving to higher quality, cost-effective care, or is this just a mantra? We have in this country some really good high-performance systems. The Commonwealth Fund under Karen Davis has for some time run a commission on high-performance system. I think Jim Mungan of Health Partners heads it. And they have identified, for example, Intermountain Healthcare or the Mayo Clinic There are quite a few. What is the Geisinger in Pennsylvania? Very high quality and reasonably low cost systems. We have them. Almost anything great in healthcare does exist in America somewhere. But you need to take those systems and make them benchmarks for everyone else to follow, which is what the Commonwealth Fund has been trying to sort of taunt the profession into. But for the medical profession, I have a challenge too. Look at the Wenberg data. He just got, won the Gus Leonhardt Award at the Institute of Medicine for his pioneering research. Why would it cost, tw- on average, twice as much per elderly in the Sun Belt than it costs in the Wheat Belt to give decent health care? Or as I've been quoted, I had it in a paper saying, how could the best health care in the world cost twice as much as the best health care in the world? I was sort of made that flippant remark because I say, if you go to Texas, they'll tell you it's the best health care in the world. And if you go to the Mayo Clinic, they'll claim that too. And yet the cost is so different. But it's worse than that, Jack. I agree with you. I think that you know that the American College of Cardiology has developed a bunch of tools. We've got registries and we've got now we've got appropriate use criteria, guidelines, standards and all that and all that sort of things you know, that we're now measuring, at least across the inpatient. And we're trying to get the outpatient data is the goal for the next two years to try to get it the best quality of care and the most effective cost efficiency. Do you think these tools can be used in the new healthcare system? You know, are we on the right path with this or, or, or is there a better path we ought to take? No, you're on the right path for the following reason. No one has yet invented a health policy that essentially represents a cram down of some stuff. People like me, I have a PhD, which means doctor who cannot help you, cram down the stuff of MDs. That has to come substantially from the MDs themselves, people who care. Like at that ACC meeting I attended not long ago with May, you may recall, And I was really heartened at the very sincere effort to actually figure out ways to deliver cost-effective health care. Physicians, at the very least, have to sit at the table and participate in this. So I think what you're doing is exactly the right thing. You cannot and shouldn't sit there and wait for some HICVA experts to figure this out. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to the docs. But together, I think it can be done. For example... When I, I chaired the commission on uh, rationalizing New Jersey healthcare last year, and I asked Jack Wenberg to run me some numbers on what does it cost for a Medicare patient in the last two years of life in various New Jersey hospitals, a small state. 
up in the northern part, it costs three times as much. Medicare wrote three times the checks that it wrote in the southern part. And I then asked the hospital executives, what is going on here? I mean, the, the, these people cannot be genetically different. And they said, well, it's the doctors. We don't have any control over what the doctors. Some of them are high billers. They do everything imaginable. And others are more conservative. And I said, well, don't you guys have any control to even talk to these guys? You know? And they claim they don't have any power over the doctors. So I would say, I hope to be speaking to the New Jersey Medical Association saying, you know, you guys have to step up to your social responsibility and clean this up. I mean, you know, either you're killing patients in the South. Well, of course, they die anyhow, but you make them suffer in the South. Or they overdo it in the north. But you have to help the American people find a more cost-effective way clinically to deliver health care, quite aside from that administrative issue. Couldn't agree with you more, Uva. I think that peer review on the macro level is what the profession's responsibility is. And there may be some other tools we've got to throw in the mix, clinical decision support to add to electronic medical records to get there. But... I wanted to ask you if you could help as we as we think through these things. We mentioned earlier the administrative cost issues and the differences here in this country in terms of high administrative cost as compared to international. What do you see in other countries? You've studied a lot of systems. What do you think we should be working on here in the U.S. from which we could get some good advice and some great examples of ways to improve the system elsewhere? Well, for example, one trip might be worth making is to Denmark. Denmark is known as the European country that is most wired, that has the best health information technology in place. And you might look, say, what could we learn about IT from Denmark? You might look to the Dutch system, who have been particularly innovative in sort of peer-reviewed quality assurance. They actually do things like where every so often, every two years, one colleague sits in on another colleague's practice and watches that doctor practice. And then they have quality circles where the doctors figure out what is the best way to do things. So instead of, again, having it crammed down, these initiatives come from doctors. We're going to take your challenge up and see what we can do in these regards and maybe put the profession back into the role of being a profession. But well, we've been talking about the prospects for health system reform in the United States with Dr. Uwe Reinhardt. Thank you so much for being our guest today, Dr. Reinhardt. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Jack. You've been listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. For more information on this week's show or to download a podcast to this segment, please visit us at ReachMD.com. Thank you for listening.